lost my notes, so I don't know how to stop it with that. Which in uh, the Peston Shorter 
case is X10 plus theta Y, and the cos theta is now 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 diagonal. It's that diagonal matrix. And so what we have is LX transpose theta LY, which is X transpose L transpose theta LY is equal to X transpose theta Y. And so as we heard last time, L transpose theta L equals theta. So that's the criterion. And remember, we said that an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation then is I plus, say, omega, where omega transpose is minus theta omega theta. And that means that this is equal to I plus theta dot R plus lambda dot B, where R are the three rotation matrices converted to four by four form just by adding zeros, and the three boost matrices, which I wrote down explicitly last time. And what we saw was that if we rewrite this in sort of physics lingo as I minus I theta dot I R minus I lambda dot I B, and then we call, I guess I might as well write it here, we say J is I R, and what do I call it? K is I B. Then what we have is J I J J, I epsilon I J K J K, which is the angular momentum computation of lasers. J I K J is I epsilon I J K K J, and K I K J is minus I epsilon I J K J K. Okay. And then what we did was we, well, we also noticed how does a four vector transform under a small Lorentz transformation? Well, it's T plus lambda dot X, and X, that is T prime is that, and X prime vector is X vector plus T lambda vector plus theta cos X. So that's for an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation, and the arbitrary Lorentz transformation is T to the minus I theta dot L minus I lambda dot K. So that's a full-fledged Lorentz transformation. And then we introduced matrices J plus minus, and they are J sub L plus or minus I K sub L, and these then formed two angular momentum computations. They do this, in other words, and J plus with J minus is just zero. So that means, let's see, I think I should just say something abstractly here. The original matrices are four by four, and one can think of all of these as four by four, and in fact all of these as four by four, and then we can have representations of these matrices or of these Lie algebras. In particular, in Hilbert space, if this is the four by four matrix, this will be a unitary operator representing this four by four matrix. This will be infinite dimensional. So infinite dimensional 
acting in the Hilbert space but we can also have finite dimensional representations but they're not going to be unitary and where since these two Lie algebras the J plus and J minus are independent Lie algebras we can have these as J and J prime of L and these will be 2J plus 1 by 2J prime plus well these actually are the direct product of the 2J plus 1 by 2J plus 1 times a let's see I'm getting a little ahead of myself here this thing is the direct product of DJ with DJ prime and so that actually then is this big it's a square matrix that's if this is in other words 2 by 2 and this is 2 by 2 then the whole thing is 4 by 4 so this matrix is this big whereas this one is 2J plus 1 by 2J plus 1 and this is 2J prime plus 1 by 2J prime plus 1 so that's the that's what these look like the order here is that the J corresponds to a J plus type J is the J plus and J prime is J minus yeah and I'll try to throw these things on a high arc I don't hit anybody in the head actually the grader can't ask questions well could ask questions but let me give you a chocolate just in case you feel that you get hit by another you feel from asking questions because you're the grader I have a question do you think that if they built the SSC we already have the Higgs particle thank you of course I have a second question if it exists we have it can everything you work on here be done just in context of 2 by 2 matrices or do you have to use higher dimension matrices well we start out with the Lorentz transformation being 4 by 4 4 by 4 and then in a moment I'm going to go to the 2 by 2 case you always do 2 by 2 don't you well they're the simplest non-trivial representation of the Lorentz is that what I need I don't want that's good enough for now thanks well I told him a moment ago okay alright so let's let me go on to say what this this in general can represent particles with spin S going from J minus J prime to J minus J prime plus 1 up to J plus J prime so those are the various spins and we were talking last time about the 1 half 0 case and there what we have is J so these are only 2 by 2 for these are going to be 2 by 2 I mean but if you pick a different value for J you'll get whatever size you want as long as the J equals 1 half right what's that they're going to be 2 by 2 for J equals J is represented by J plus plus J minus and K is represented by minus I J plus plus I J minus so this is Hermitian and this is anti-Hermitian 
Okay, now, in particular, for the J equal to one half and J prime equal to zero case, J is just equal to sigma over two, and K then is equal to minus I sigma over two from this. And by the way, these rules just come from these equations here, these definitions. And the Lorentz transformation then is E to the minus I theta dot J minus I lambda dot K. That one is going to be called D one half zero of theta and lambda, and it's going to be E to the minus I theta dot sigma over two minus I lambda dot, well, the minus, the I's give us lambda dot sigma over two. So this, since these are Hermitian and there's a minus sign here, this part of the matrix is not unitary, but this part represents rotations, and it is unitary. Okay, and more generally, you can say that this, you can effectively write this as E to the minus Z dot sigma over two, where Z is a complex three vector, and lambda is the real part of Z, and theta is the imaginary part of Z. And these then are two by two matrices. They're complex, and they have determinant one. Let's see, is there a simple way of showing why they have determinant one? In general, the determinant of a matrix is, E to the trace of the logarithm, or the logarithm of the trace, and the trace of the sigma matrices is zero, so the determinant is one. In any case, the determinant is one. Now, doesn't E to the log just give us the thing in the log? I mean, that would just be the trace today. You're right, you're right. Well, the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. Maybe it is, maybe it was trace one. Well, this is the product of the eigenvalues. If you imagine this thing as a diagonal matrix, then this is just E to the trace of the log. Doesn't this just give you the product of the eigenvalues all over again? You know the sigma matrices are... Trace Hermitian, too, right? They're Hermitian and trace. So then you have to have a unitary if it's E to something that's a Hermitian, and then the unitary will... This part is unitary, and this part is non-unitary. And... Anyway, the determinant is one, and so they form this group SL2C, and I don't want to fuss with this for the moment, but I think something like that is correct. Now, what's interesting is that minus I sigma transforms as a four vector. I'm going to call that SA. And what does that mean? That means that D dagger one half zero theta lambda minus the two by two identity D a half zero theta lambda is minus I plus lambda dot sigma. And to see why this is... This is for infinite 
this transforms as a four vector under this, but I want to do this just for infinitesimal lambda and sigma. And so this is um, e to the, to write it simply, it's e to the minus z dot sigma over 2 minus i. And then it's the adjoint of this. So this is e to the minus z star dot sigma over 2. And so this is minus 1 minus z star dot sigma over 2 minus z dot sigma over 2. And so this is minus 1, or, or better yet, it's minus 1 uh, plus a half z plus z star dot sigma. And uh, z plus z star is the real part. And so this is minus i plus lambda dot sigma, where lambda is the real part of z. And so this verifies that part. And now, to do the other part, what we have is e to the minus z star dot sigma over 2. And um, I'll call that sigma j and e to the uh, minus z dot sigma over 2. And so this is 1 minus z star dot sigma over 2, say sigma j, 1 minus z dot sigma over 2. And so that's going to give us clearly sigma j. And then um, for the for the real part of the thing, what we've got is minus um, the, the real part of, of well, actually, I've got this. All right, let me let me split this up into real imaginary parts then. This is um, minus i theta dot sigma over 2, and then minus lambda dot sigma over 2. And then this is the adjoint of that. So this is plus i theta dot sigma over 2. Um, adjoint, so it's just minus lambda dot sigma over 2. And so that's my, uh, plus i over 2 theta i um, sigma i commutator sigma j to the theta part, right? And then the rest is an anti-commutator of sigma j to sigma i, which um, is in fact, all right, so let me just write it as minus, I'll write it as lambda i over 2, the anti-commutator of sigma i with sigma j. And this is 2i epsilon i j k theta k. And this is 2 delta i j. And so altogether, that should be um, uh, sigma j. We want this to be sigma j minus lambda j plus theta cross sigma. Well, this gives us lambda j because this is 2 delta i j. And this is the 2's cancel. We should get sigma. Yes. And I don't like that minus sign. Ah, 
It's J I. It's theta I. J I. It's J I. I got J and I from backwards. So there's a minus from the I squared, right? But then this commutator gives you a theta I sigma K, which will also give you another minus sign. All right, let's do it a little more carefully with more chalk. Boy, it's hard to find the chalk for all these things. And I owe you a All right. So let's just get this sign correct. It's minus I theta dot sigma over two there. So minus I theta dot sigma over two. Then we have a sigma j. And then it's the adjoint of that. So it's I theta dot sigma over two. Okay, so this gives us theta i Oh, um, I'm, I'm doing this wrong. It's, 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 a, it's a cause of 1 plus this and 1 minus that. So what you get is the sigma j and then plus i theta i over to sigma i times theta sigma j, which is sigma j plus i theta i over to 2 i on i j k sigma k. And so this is sigma j minus um, and then it's theta i, epsilon i, j, k, sigma k. But um, if you, you can absorb this, if you change that to j i, and that is sigma j plus theta cross sigma j. In other words, you have to commute this one. So altogether, um, This part is well, let me just it's P dagger sigma D is sigma minus uh, lambda times I, or it's it's better written as minus I lambda plus theta cross theta. All right, so that's, so the transform as a four vector, that's for an infinitesimal transformation. More generally, d dagger, one half zero for a full scale Lorentz transformation, SA d of one half zero L is going to be LAB SA, where SA is minus i sigma. Why are we looking at this SA object? Well, it, why, it, why is it minus it, I just want to say that it's a four vector. Why, why minus the identity instead of just the identity? It's just way, it's the way God made the world. Cool. What is, is, that, that, is that an inner product or? Oh, no. In the case of, in the case of zero, one half will be, it will be plus oh. one. All right, now, the reason I went through that in detail is how does a, um, how does a two-spinner transform the Lorentz transformation? Now, this is the unitary, this is the Hilbert space, this is the field operator. It's going to be d one-half zero of L inverse C of L of X. So this is how we want the thing to transform. And I'll be saying more about why the field transforms this way because of the way the particles transform in the Lorentz transformations next time. But, but sorry. let me just 
Is there a question? Yeah. When you write essay, is that like two components of a vector? What do you mean by this kind of thing? It's an error product. It's just a vector. Or is it an error product? No, it's not an error product. It's just a vector. Yeah. Okay. Four. Okay. Yeah, so it's just a four vector. Minus on the components of the four vector are two by two matrices. Minus I and then sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, this is called a left-handed vial spinner. And what I want to show you now is that the action density L of X is actually covariant. This is the left-handed kinetic part of the action density. So D zero I minus delta sigma C of X, or equivalently, this is I C dagger D mu D D A S A C. And I pulled out a minus sign, so there's a minus there. Okay. What I want to show is that under this Lorentz transformation, U of L, L of X, the inverse of L is equal to L sub L of L X. That is to say, it transforms covariantly. It doesn't go into L sub L of X, it goes into L sub L of L X. And you can see that the L X is going to happen because when the U's act on the field operators, the C's in L of X, the argument of L of X goes, the argument of C of X goes to C of L of X. Okay. Now, one subtlety here is that in this L sub L of L X, this is, in other words, let me put this minus sign here. I think it will look a little bit nicer if I do that. This is then I C dagger of L X minus D prime A S A C of L X. That is to say, the L X occurs not only in the argument of the field operators, but also in the derivatives. This is the derivative, not with respect to X A, but with respect to X A prime. Has an S A transformed as well? Well, S A, S A, yes, yes, it's transformed, and the transformation of S A is what got us the prime here. Okay. Great question. Do you want to know where you're stuck? I'm stuck. Okay. In particular, this thing here, actually, for some reason, I've written it as a P. All right. Let me just switch to P here. Let me say what this is. P prime B, well, first of all, X prime is L X, so that means that X is L inverse X prime, and so D prime B is partial with respect to X prime B, and that's partial of X prime, with respect to X prime B of X A, partial with respect to X A. On the other hand, this thing in tensor notation is X A is L inverse A B X prime B, and so the partial of X A with respect to X prime B is L inverse A B, partial 
text A, or to write it more simply, D prime B is L inverse A B D A. Okay. Now let's apply this transformation rule and this transformation rule to show that this action density of the kinetic part is Lorentz invariant. So what we have then is the U of L I C dagger of X. Let me see. Oh, there we are. Well, minus D A S A C of X U inverse of L. So this is going to be I C dagger of L of X D. You see it's a D of L inverse. So this is going to be D dagger of L inverse of X. And minus D A S A D of L inverse of X. Not L inverse of X. L inverse. C of L of X. And now we have D adjoint of L inverse on S A D of L inverse. That is going to give us this equation, but with L replaced by L inverse. So in other words, D dagger of L inverse S A D of L inverse is L inverse A B S B. So the complicated part of this, these matrices, just give us I C dagger of L of X minus D A. And now we have L inverse A B S B C of L of X. But we just saw that L inverse A B D A, which is L inverse A B D A, written backwards, is C prime B. And so this is equal to I C dagger of L of X minus D prime B S B C of L of X. So you see, and this of course is I L of L of X. So that's what's meant by the action density being Lorentz invariant. So the Ds are only going to conjugate other sort of objects that are composed of two by two matrices? Because by, so my question is why the partial derivatives don't see that to begin with? Well, let's understand what's happening. We have a unitary operator that acts on operators. So it transforms the field operators into D times the field operator at the other point. And it transforms this S object. And what? And it transforms this S object. Well, no, it doesn't really transform the S operator. The unitary transformation transforms the fields. And so the effect was limited to this and this, whereas this part minus DASA is invariant. Then the matrices, the matrices transform the SA part. And they transform it in such a way as to give us this. And then this is interpreted as the derivative with respect to the X prime equal to LX. 
But I mean, what you said is probably also true. I'm fine with the last sentence. Your, your way of saying it is... I guess I didn't realize that from that first line to the second line, we now have, we've got Ds instead of, instead of the unitaries. Right. This is the unitary operator on the field operators. And to tell you the truth, what's happened here, so you're just pulling up something that I sloughed over. U of L, C dagger, what we have here is U inverse of L, and then another U of L here. So that it's U of L, C, U inverse of L gives us D of L inverse, C of L of X. You've inserted the identity here between those. Yes, U inverse U. And now U... But those are just operators, so the operators commute with them. And it's now the representation of U, which is D, that is... That's right. And acted on S. Okay. Right. So U, L, C dagger, U inverse of L is C dagger, L of X, D dagger, L inverse. And just to show you that for a moment, it's that U of L, C of X, U inverse of L is D of L inverse, C of L, X. And so when you take the adjoint of that, you get C adjoint, D adjoint, C adjoint of L, X, D adjoint of L inverse equals U of L, C adjoint of X, U inverse of L. And the U is unitary, so U inverse, U adjoint are the same thing. So this four vector that you have over here, if I found the four vector from any representation of the SU2, everything should hold with the... Could you speak a little slower? I've got to process the accent. So if you have the four vector that you found from the SU2, right? This, I showed a moment ago that this was a four vector. Yes. Under this, under the four vector in precisely this form. Yes, yes. So you have, over here you have these sigma matrices, so they are all SU2, right? Yes, these are three sigma matrices and then a minus... Yes, so I could do some higher order representation of the SU2, and then I would have this, so instead of a D half, I would have some other corresponding dimension matrix, right? You mean if you use a higher representation here? Yes. Yes, and you could do that, and then you'd have to put something different here. Yes, so I would use a different representation of SU2 instead of... Or you mean of SL2C. Yes, SL2C. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do that for the 0, 1 half. But it can be done for any higher order, right? Well, the form of the action density does change as you go up in spin. For example, a massless D1 half, 1 half, that's the photon, and the kinetic action is FU nu squared, which doesn't look anything like this. That's one of the things that I warned you guys about in the first or second lecture, namely that you start out with a nice Lagrangian formalism for a scalar field, and you sort of think, oh, this is going to work. But you see with spin 1 half, it already looks completely different, and then you bring up a higher spin. Well, FU nu squared doesn't look anything like this. So, I don't know. It's a rocky road. I suppose if we were doing these things in supersymmetric notation, it would all look more uniform. It would also be more confusing. So let's just learn this part first. All right, so we've got that this is Lorentz invariant, and in particular, the way these derivatives transform guarantee that a divergence is Lorentz, or whatever events covariant, I guess I should say, because that's D prime A, B prime A, and so that is D, B, L inverse, B, A, L, A, C, B, C, and you see this is just D, B, delta, B, C, 
3C, which is just DB, DB. So the divergence is invariant. Now, did I, I don't know if I went through this last time. I don't think I did, but it's probably worth doing even if I did. What's the equation of motion for this field? Well, this is the Lebron density or the kinetic part of the action density. And what you can sort of see just by looking at it is that it's stationary if from here to the right is zero. Because after all, then, a small change in C dagger multiplied by zero is zero. And equivalently, a small change in C, if you sort of integrate by parts on C dagger. All right. So anyway, the equation of motion is D0I minus delta sigma C of X equals zero. So this is the equation of motion for this massless field. And in momentum space, this is equal to E plus P dot sigma on, say, C of P equal to zero. And if you multiply that by E minus P dot sigma from the left, you get E minus P dot sigma E plus P dot sigma C of P equals zero. Well, this just gives you E squared minus P squared P vector squared C of P is zero. And that says that E is the length of the vector P, which is to say the particle is indeed massless. Remember, though, that in the standard model before symmetry breaking, all the fields are massless. So having particles massless is a good place to start. I'll add in the mass term in a minute. You've seen the mass term. Anyway, so this equation tells you then that the length of P is plus P dot sigma on C of P is zero. Is there a question? Is it Lorentz symmetry that's being broken, or is it the translational symmetry that's being broken? When you add mass, you're certainly not breaking Lorentz invariance. Here, here. You're not breaking translation. You're not breaking anything. What you break when you add, well, let's put it this way. If you add mass here to this theory, you're not breaking any symmetry. You just add this Meyer on a mass term, which I mentioned last time, and I'm going to do again. What did I want to say? In the standard model, what happens is that a particular field, the Higgs field, when the Higgs field has a mean value of zero in the vacuum, the energy is positive, distinctly positive. And so the system can lower its energy by having the Higgs field assume a value in the vacuum that is different from zero, and, in fact, is a value that's of the order of 100 GeV. And when it assumes that value, then all the particles get mass. And, of course, it's almost all. All right, so what is this telling us? This is telling us that P hat dot J, which is on C, which is to say P hat dot sigma over 2 on C, is equal to minus a half C. So this is telling us that C is an eigenvector of, this is called the helicity operator. Well, not really operator. Well, part of the operator. Helicity, and you see the helicity is minus a half. The helicity is the 
projection of the angular momentum in the direction of motion. Is that why this is left-handed? Yeah. That's why it's left-handed. You want some more? <laughs> By the way, the rest of you guys can ask questions and get candid. So I'll just get my way. Did anybody ask a question and not get a candid? I sometimes get involved more with the question than with the answer. Okay, well, we saw last time that a Meyer on a mass term is uh, of the form minus m c transpose sigma 2 c and then minus m, the Hermitian conjugate of this, which is uh, c transpose sigma 2 c angular. Um, and I went through quickly at the end of the hour why this was Lorentz invariant. Did, does, does anyone want to see that, or did I do that in enough detail at the end of the last hour? I don't really remember it. So. <laughs> you want to see it again? Uh, I'd like to. Oh, all right. Great. Fine. I have time. OK, what uh, does this look like? It's e to the minus z dot sigma over 2 c. In other words, let, let me do let me just focus on this part rather than also the emission conjugate. So uh, let us just say then the U of L, and let me let me leave out the M also, since it's a constant. C transpose of X sigma two C of X U inverse of L. What is it going to be? Well. That's going to be C transpose of L of X D transpose of L inverse sigma 2 D of L inverse C of L of X. So that's how the thing transforms, right? Now this is actually pretty simple because this thing is e to the minus z dot sigma over 2. This is a sigma 2. And this is e to the minus z dot sigma transpose over 2. And the z is the z appropriate for L inverse. All right. Now the point here is that the sigma matrices, sigma 1 and sigma 3, are symmetric. Sigma 2 is anti-symmetric. So sigma 2's sign gets flipped here. On the other hand, sigma 1 and sigma 3 anti-commute with sigma 2. So when you pull this, a sigma 1 through a sigma 2, you get a minus sign. When you pull a sigma 3 through a sigma 2, you get a minus sign. So sigma 1 and sigma 3 get minus signs when you pull them through, and sigma 2 gets a minus sign because of transposition. So altogether, this is sigma 2 e to the minus z dot minus sigma over 2 times e to the minus z dot sigma over 2. And so these two things just give us sigma 2. So this then is just C transpose of L of X sigma 2 C of L of X. So that's how the Majorana mass term works. Why? It's invariant. Um, curiously, this, this um, this stuff wasn't really widely known until about 1980, oddly enough. I mean, people who worked in that particular area, who were the physics knew about mystery, but um, it wasn't widely, widely known by physicists until about 1980. I remember. 
first learning about it in a lecture by Edward Whitten. And this was at a conference where everybody was giving lectures and packing as much as they could into each of their lectures. And people were sitting there and just being sort of washed out with all the detail. And Whitten got up and just taught everybody this. And just that. He could have said many other things. But instead he just taught us that. And everybody was so happy that they had actually understood the lecture and learned something. All right. So that's the one around there. Anybody have a short question? Okay. Well, this was so much for one half zero. Now if we go to zero one half. What we have is for D zero one half. What we have is that J is still a half sigma. But now K is I sigma over two. So the sign of K is transformed. L again is E to the minus I theta dot J minus I lambda dot K. But now this thing is represented by D of zero one half of theta and lambda, which is E to the minus I theta dot sigma over two. So same rotational part because J hasn't changed. But now it's plus lambda dot sigma over two. And equivalently we can write it as E to the Z star dot sigma over two, where again theta is the imaginary part and lambda the real part of the complex three vector Z. Under Lorentz transformation, under this D dagger, this D dagger, I D is just one plus lambda dot sigma. And D dagger sigma D is sigma plus I lambda plus theta cross sigma. So that means that the four vector here as A is now I sigma. This is under infinitesimal Lorentz transformations. But more generally, D dagger of L, S A, D of L is then L A D S B, where S now is this. And that means that L right of X, which is now I zeta dagger of X, D zero I plus L dot sigma zeta of X is Lorentz covariant as long as under the Lorentz transformation, now this is a unitary operator representing this Lorentz transformation. This is D zero one half of L zeta of L X. All right. Now, the wave equation, since that's the action, the wave equation is D zero I. Do you have a question there? Yeah. So in momentum space, this is E minus P dot sigma of zeta of P. And once again, that tells us that P hat dot J, oh boy, those are those big typos. This tells us that 
the helicity is positive, so this is a right-handed field. Does somebody have a pen? Okay, so that transforms that way. Now, what this is saying, by the way, in the case of the real world where we have neutrinos, this says that this is the way neutrinos transform. Neutrinos are nearly massless, and so they're nearly left-handed. Over here, anti-neutrinos transform this way, and anti-neutrinos are nearly massless and nearly right-handed. And the Majoran mass term now is the same. It's zeta transpose sigma 2 zeta with a minus m plus a mission conjugate. So this is the Majoran mass term in this case. And just to check that it is Lorentz invariant, well, it's now, what did we say it was? We said it was e to the z star dot sigma. Well, you can see it's the same argument. It's e to the z star dot sigma over 2 zeta sigma 2 e, and this is going to be transpose, so it's going to be e to the z star dot sigma transpose over 2. Once again, transpose flips the sign of sigma 2. Sigma 2 flips the other two signs. You get a minus sign, and so this is equal to sigma 2 zeta transpose sigma 2 e to the minus z star dot sigma over 2 e to the z star dot sigma over 2 zeta. So this is just zeta transpose sigma 2 zeta. So that's the other Majoran mass term. Now, for the Dirac case, what we have is that j is now going to be, well, first of all, what's the representation? It's a, it's d1 half 0 direct sum of d0 1 half. Not direct product, direct sum, so it's a 4 by 4 matrix, and j is now written as basically j1 half 0, and then j0 1 half, so it's jj like that, which is simply 1 half sigma 0 0 sigma. And now k is i over 2 minus sigma 0 0 sigma. So it's like that. Now, something remarkable happens here, and this is called the Clifford algebra. You introduce these things called gamma matrices, one of Dirac's many magical tricks. The anti-commutator of gamma a with gamma b, these are 4 by 4 matrices, is going to be 2 a to a b, where, of course, a to is, in this case, it's 2, 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. And I must say that the PNS metric for Dirac notation actually works better. Somehow the minus signs cancel. Now, what's remarkable here is that the generators of the Lorentz group, which can be written in this way, epsilon i, j, k, j, k. So, in other words, we're going from two three vectors, j and k, to six operators that are written with upper indices. j, i, j, like that. j, 0, j is going to be k lower j. And you raise and lower things with a, but we're not going to do much raising and lowering. Anyway, the remarkable thing is that j, a, b, 
is simply idle before the commutator of gamma A with gamma B. And, you know, so you can just get mesmerized with that. Isn't that amazing? It then follows that JAB with gamma C, you can show, is minus gamma A, A to B, C, plus gamma B, A to A, C. And now, in fact, the commutation relations of the Lorentz group, which are I, JAB, JCD, A to A, C, there are four terms here. It's going to be a little bit tedious, but anyway. Minus A to B, C, JAD, minus A to A, D, JB, C, plus A to B, D, JA, C. Okay. So I hope that I've switched from Finley's metric to Heston's metric without any typos. I can assure you there are only a finite number of typos. But that's the only thing I can be certain of. Okay. What is a good representation of these gamma matrices? When people do atomic physics, they use a representation of the gamma matrices that's convenient for atomic physics. For particle physics, or highly relativistic problems, a better choice is this. That is to say, gamma zero is just this sort of cockeyed identity matrix, and the gammas are sigma minus sigma. Now, what is the definition of the gamma matrices? The definition is there are four four by four matrices that satisfy this rule. The anti-commutator is two eta alpha, but two eta AB. In fact, if you have any set of gamma matrices that satisfies this, you can have another set, gamma A prime equal to S, gamma A S inverse, where S is any four by four matrix. So given this set of gamma matrices, you have infinitely many others generated this way. So in fact, indeed, if I have made a typo somewhere, there are infinitely many typos generated this way. By the fact that you can have infinitely many equivalent representations of this phenomenon. Anyway, no matter what the gamma matrices are, I over four times the commutator gives you a J that satisfies this commutation relation and gives you the commutation relations of the Lorentz group. So it's a really remarkable structure. But the nice thing about this choice is it allows us to keep the one half zero and the zero one half parts separate. And I see a little bit of black blackboard back here. I'm going to go back here. So in particular, we can introduce a Majorana field. This will be C and zeta. And now if we have two of them, suppose we have one here and another one here. So this is one. Two. We can combine them. If they have the same mass, we can combine them. And we can combine them to form a Dirac spinner, which is just one over root two, sine Majorana one, 
plus I sine 2 minor 1. I like that. And we can write that as a C direct zeta direct. So this is a, previously I was talking about a, a particular C. You can have C1 plus I C2 and zeta 1 plus I zeta 2 like that. Now, what is the action for the direct um, by spinner, I guess you can call it. Well, it's L is equal to psi bar. So am I right in thinking this is sort of analogous to when we had uh, two real fields versus a single scalar? Yes, 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 yes exactly. Right. Psi bar I DA gamma A DA minus M psi. Where here I put in what's called a Dirac mass term. So this is a Dirac mass term. Um, this notation. So that would be related to whatever the original Majorana mass was, somehow? Because we said they yes, had to have the same yes, mass. You can, you, can, you can, in fact, yes, you can write the Dirac mass terms as Majorana mass terms. There really are only Majorana mass terms. This is then in Feynman's notation, I d slash minus m psi. And I spent a good 15 minutes this afternoon figuring out a latex expression for <laughs> slash. Um, um, if any of you want to know, come down in my office and I'll show you what it is. Um, what is psi bar? Psi bar is defined as psi dagger gamma zero. And this is psi dagger zero one one zero, everything in two by two notation. And this is zeta dagger c dagger. And this kinetic action up here is just equal to the sum of the two, act two kinetic actions we had before. Namely, oh, I see I have a typo here. Uh, this thing is equal to I C dagger E zero I minus L dot sigma C plus I zeta dagger E zero I plus L dot sigma zeta. And the Dirac mass term, which is minus M psi bar psi, is minus M Well, we're almost out of time. I'll just end with this. Minus M zeta dagger C plus C dagger zeta. All right. Um, well, so this looks like, this is called a Dirac mass term. And it looks very different, but um, well, next time I'll show you how to write it in terms of my own messages. I guess that's enough for today. Any questions? All right, anyway, as I said, I've taken the uh, the most relevant pages out of this book I'm writing and put them into a PDF file that I call extract on the web page. And that way um, you don't have to fool around with a nearly 600 page PDF file. So if anybody have a question or is anybody hungry and wants it? <laughs>